Welcome to the 3-0 Show, part of the Athletic Baseball Show. It is Thursday, February 9th. Derek Van Riper, Eno Saris, Katie Wu here with you. And because we are closing in on the start of spring training, about a week away from pitchers and catchers reporting to Arizona and Florida, we figured this would be a fantastic time to have a draft. It is the 2023 rebound draft. So we are looking for players who underperformed for a variety of reasons last season and trying to predict which of those players will get back to their previous form. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a five-round draft with the three of us. There are a few simple requirements. Each of us has to select two hitters and two pitchers. The fifth player can be anything we want. Order that we build these rosters does not matter. Last season, the player that we draft cannot have accrued more than one war. We're using fan graphs for our war source this year. And in previous seasons, before 2022, they must have reached at least two wins above replacement in a season. So they can't just be breakout players who are good for the first time. This is someone that has established a track record of being good in the past, fell off last season, and will then exceed expectations and get back to being a great player again this year. Now, how we're going to score it is at the end of 2023, we're going to remember this by putting a Google Calendar note into our calendars to add these things up and find out who actually accrued the most wins above replacement with the five players they selected today. So there will be a winner in this draft, and there will be two losers in this draft, and hopefully that winner will be me. So we did a random.org draft order randomizer tool function, and it actually gave the exact same result that I put in. Katie has the first pick. Eno has the second pick. I have the third pick. We're going to use a snaking order to go through. Did it actually rounds. work is the question. I it think did it was nothing. meant to be. It was meant to be, you guys. You can't argue with results. Yeah, yeah. It's funny. Katie seems to be very happy with those results. But, uh, so with that, Katie has the first pick. We're going to talk about why we think these players are going to bounce back and have a lot of fun as we kind of look at some players that should, hopefully, get back to being great players again. Oh, and before Katie picks, one very important distinction. We decided that Fernando Tatis Jr., is ineligible for this draft. Not for any particular reason other than because he missed so much time and because I think he's the clear consensus number one pick in something like this, we just want to exclude him. He's kind of an obvious <laughs> selection. So what we're going to Maybe do the is, inspiration for the whole thing, really. Inspiration. And Tatis gets his own team. He has his own team in terms of war. So if our teams do not beat Fernando Tatis Jr.'s 2023 <laughs> war, we are double losers. Then we all lose. <laughs> because we have five <laughs> players, and he's only one player who's going to miss a few weeks to begin the season. So the beat all Tatis that is draft. Yes, so the beat, the beat Tatis, Tatis 2023 draft. rebound draft. So, Katie, who would you like with the first selection? Okay, well, some background information before we actually started recording the podcast. Uh, we were going back and forth on the amount of position players that we thought were likely candidates and how the pitching candidates weren't necessarily as strong or as many. So every single indicator in me in terms of strategy says you should pick a pitcher because we're all in agreement that there's not a lot of, of strong candidates here. Yet everything in my mind is saying position player because I have one I really like. But for the first time, I think I'm going to do strategy. And I hope that I set you guys up for failure here as I take what I think uh, one of the biggest contenders for a bounce back season from a pitching perspective. I'm going to go with Trevor Rogers. Nice. There you go. Thanks. There Thank you, you very go. much. What an honor <laughs> to go first in this draft. Get rid of that tab. Yes. I knew Trevor it. Rogers. <laughs> I spoiled it. I spoiled it by talking about Miami in the beginning. That's right. Well, I mean, you know, uh, my, my pitching plus model liked him still said he, he had above average stuff. Uh, his four seamer was really destroyed among, you know, among the top 10 worst four seamers in baseball last year, but he has a nice park. I mean, do you basing it mostly on park or sort of rebound in health or where, where did you see that there's an opportunity for him? I mean, I know that he ended the 2022 season. He wasn't very healthy and I did see the fastball, but I, I don't think that when you look at what he did in 2021 and the numbers he put up there and you look at Miami and, and just gen they lost Pablo Lopez, of course. And you look at that rotation. Of course, there's Sandy. Uh, I'm I've always been pretty big on Jesus Lazardo, and I think Johnny Cueto is a perfect fit there. But for Miami to to really, I think fit their expectations, Trevor Rogers is going to have to play a big part in it. So when I'm looking at draft strategies, I'm looking at how much is this player going to need to impact his team going forward. 
I do think injuries played a part in his lack of success in 2022, but we saw what he could do in 2021 when he was an all-star. And I think he's a, I'm not quite sure he can repeat that all-star caliber performance, but I think he's due for, for a bounce back in 2023. Yeah, he was yeah. under three ERA in 2021, 264, the 115 whip, well over a strikeout per inning, 157 strikeouts in 133 frames. I mean, if he gets to 150 or 160 innings this year, kind of working as part of the middle of that Marlins rotation, that alone is pretty valuable. You're probably looking at at least two, two and a half wins, but he was a four win player in that 2021 breakout season. So I like this as a guy that people are overlooking in a lot of areas. Pretty safe, I think, in that Marlins rotation, too, of course, with Pablo Lopez gone. I think it's kind of Sandy Alcantara, Jesus Lazardo, Trevor Rogers, and Cueto with sort of a battle for that number five starter spot. I don't think Rogers has to earn his spot in the rotation. Uh, if the Marlins are going to exceed expectations, pitching, of course, will be a big part of how they get there. You know, you are now on the clock with pick number two in our 2023 rebound draft. There is a pitcher I like more than the rest but there's a second picture i like kind of as good so i'm gonna go with the hitter i'm going with jonathan india just right there the top in terms of you know if you do the sort for projected uh, for you know had less than a win or last year and what the difference is in projections jonathan india is fourth on that list uh, and he's projected to have a uh, nearly three wins next year, and he had a half a win last year. Uh, in terms of health, we know there's a lot going on. There's, this, there's the the calf. He had a, a crazy thing happen to him where he was hit by a pitch in the calf at uh, the Field of Dreams game, and it swelled up, and then he tried to go back and take another swing, and he collapsed in pain. And they thought it might be compartment syndrome where he might be at risk of losing his leg. So they airlift him out of the field and dreams game. And he plays two days later. He's fine. It's no big deal. <laughs> so uh, I know he also had some hamstring issues, but he, an interesting thing was his sprint speed dropped from yes, yeah, sprint speed dropped a lot, but it dropped from like, the 75th percentile to like the 60th percentile. So he still has above average speed. He hasn't lost all of his athleticism. He's going to be healthier this year, I believe. And uh, he has all the opportunity in the world there in, in Cincinnati. And uh, I think Jonathan India is that right collection of young enough uh, to overcome the injuries that he had in the past. Yeah, I, think, I like that. Yeah, I like this pick just because there's a – very, very clear path to everyday playing time, which is huge in something like this. When you're looking for a bounce back, you just want someone who's going to be a big part of their team's plans, being in the middle of a rebuild. Jonathan India is going to get 600 plate appearances so long he's health, as long as he's healthy enough to collect them. Um, and I think the skills across the board, really well-balanced player, can definitely be a, a good pick for you here in the first round. You know, On the short list of reasons why you might tune into a Reds game, in 2023 i think you if you're a casual fan and you're gonna jumping around on mlb tv you're gonna tune in when hunter green pitches you're gonna tune in when nick lodolo pitches you might occasionally tune in when graham ashcraft pitches if you're really a pitching nerd 98 and with a, a crazy cutter yep and then other days you're watching something else that's just the way it's be. <laughs> but hey, that's that's better than a lot of bad teams most bad teams don't have three starting pitchers that you might actually want to watch so you india has also on that one uh, is also, uh, you know, willing to go on social media and question his own team's leadership, which uh, <laughs> I think is, uh, makes him fun and interesting. He went on Twitter recently um, and retweeted someone who said, hey, it's really weird uh, that the, I think it was Reds in Four, um, mm. uh, a, a, a devout listener, uh, Reds and four said, isn't it weird that the Reds have just accrued all these second basemen? What does that mean for Jonathan India's plans? You know, Jonathan India's future with the team, basically. And India was like retweeted with like the eyes emoji or like makes you think or forget exactly what it was. But it was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah, pretty much all of their top position player prospects right now for the Reds all sit on the left side of the diamond, which means they're going to have to move somewhere. You, you can't play, you know, so many players on the left side. They got Ellie De La Cruz and Nolvi Marte and Cam Collier and Christian Encarnacion Strand and Edwin Arroyo and Spencer Steer and Matt McClain. That's seven players. They're not all going to play third base and shortstop. So definitely could see where that uh, concern comes from. I'm amazed 
that you both left me Tyler Glass now. <laughs> my birthday. I was certain. I was certain that this was the player Katie was going to take. And when Glass now was still there at two, I thought Eno was going to just pounce right away. I did this the most nerdy way possible. I took a look at all the eligible players. I put them into a giant spreadsheet, looked at projected war according to the bat for pitchers and the bat X for hitters. Tyler Glass now, far and away, the highest projected war player eligible for this draft. Just about four wins is the projection, 3.8 to be precise. He's a big part of the Rays' potential success. Well, how many innings on that projection, though? How many innings do you think are on that projection? 160. Yeah, 158. So it's that's fine. I think that's reasonable. I think that would be the first time you ever did that in the major leagues, right? But I don't think it's the first time he's done now. it ever, right? He's it's done it not the first time he's done it ever. He did it twice in the minor leagues. See that to me that that matters. I think when we're trying to figure out what pitchers are capable of doing coming off of Tommy John surgery, I think workloads prior to what they did in the big leagues might actually give us a a better north star than. Uh, than what they've done so far only at the big league level. So Glassnell's the guy for me. Skills are off the charts good. I think he could be a top 10 pitcher on a per inning basis. Uh, if you're looking for comps, I mean, maybe he could do something similar to what Spencer Strider did last year in Atlanta. That's the sort of season I'm expecting to get from Tyler Glassnell. Uh, I think because of their depth, of all the players we're going to talk about, a lot of these players are critical to a team making the playoffs. Glassnell is obviously important to the Rays, but if he does come up short in innings, if he gives me 80 or 100 innings instead... I don't think that sinks them. I think they've got enough depth to actually get by if he has a setback or some other injury slows him down at some point this season. There is such a thing as the Tommy John honeymoon, uh, which gives you about three to 400 innings between uh, your surgery and, uh, you know, any risk of, uh, of a second one. Uh, however, he got the internal brace Tommy John, which is a new type of Tommy John. We don't necessarily have as much sample in the research on that. And he's had other issues as well. So uh, it's a great pick. I'm just nit picking mm -hmm. the nits because I'm jealous. It was a great Did, pick. He didn't I come up in my method of sorting. <laughs> Nerd searches for the win. Happy to uh, get Tyler Glass now with the third overall pick being on the end. I also get the first pick of round two. And since you're both very worried about pitching, I'm going to get my second pitcher. So I don't necessarily have to draft another one after this. It's Chris Sale. We have talked about him on this show a few different times. I think He's very important to any sort of projection that would put the Red Sox in the playoffs in 2023. A lot of missed time. I mean, 2022 was the ultimate bad luck injury loss season for sale. I think the thing I'm clinging to as far as being willing to trust that the skills are still there is that the velocity really wasn't bad in the very, very brief time that we saw him five and two thirds innings last season for Chris Sale. But I think you could talk about someone that can still give you a mid threes ERA good whip, plenty of strikeouts. Maybe it's a little closer to strikeout per inning stuff than the lead the league in Ks sort of stuff that we used to have. That plays well. And I think much like Glass now, I'm looking for 150, maybe 160 innings from Sale. If he somehow goes above that, great. That's just even more war tacked onto my total. But Chris Sale, for me, one of the best pitchers available in a draft like this. I feel like you're going high risk, high reward with your pitching. I don't hate it. <laughs> I don't hate it. I'm not that brave. Um, but if these two pan out, I mean, Tatis could be in trouble. So we'll see. <laughs> I'm just trying to beat Tatis. I'm not even worried about beating you two. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel nervous now about pitching. Uh, so I think I'm going to go uh, with a pitcher here. I'm looking at two pitchers that lost a lot of velo at the end of the year. And I'd rather not be looking at two pitchers <laughs> that lost a lot of velo. I'd rather be looking at two pitchers that showed good velo in the end of the year, but uh, you took those guys. Um, so uh, <laughs> I am looking at Senor Michael Kopech from the White Sox is my pick as the second pitcher. He has not uh, struck out as many batters as he, he did not strike out as many batters in 2022 as he did the year before. Uh, but it was not due to a real drop in stuff as much as it was due to a drop in command. And you can see kind of wild oscillations in his walk rate uh, from year to year. And he does not have good natural command. However, my bet here is that with the knees in better shape, uh, you know, that uh, he will show the better end of his command, make more out of his natural stuff. And, uh, 
I think that the White Sox future as a team does depend a little on how much he can personally rebound. I mean, uh, you also have another rebound candidate in that rotation uh, that my model doesn't like as much, so I'm not going to go there. But, uh, you know, somebody needs to step up behind Dylan Cease and uh, be a true number two there. And I like Michael Kopech's chances as much as anybody's. I like that pick, especially when you look at the White Sox and the AL Central. I do think it's pretty much anyone's division, but if the White Sox even need to stand a chance, they're going to have to have some solid starting pitching. I know that's not exactly groundbreaking to say. Most good teams have good starting <laughs> pitching, but I, I think there, there's no question the Copics value to the White Sox is, is very pivotal this year, especially given the state of what's happening with a couple other pitchers that are on their roster right now. Yeah, I'm surprised right. projections don't like Kopech a bit more. I mean, I realized last season that walk rate was up, that K rate was down. But you look at prior to 2022, he'd flash skills both in the big leagues and in the minors that pointed to a guy that was really starting to figure it all out and put all the pieces together. The stuff is pretty filthy. So I would definitely take the, not the over on the ratios, because that means that'd be worse, but I would take the under on the projected ratios when you see those mid-fours ERAs for Michael Kopech. I think he could be a pretty solid mid-threes guy again, probably with more strikeouts than we saw a year ago. And as for Stuff Plus, which just looks at the physical characteristics of his pitches and grades them, uh, you know, qu- uh, comparable starting pitchers are Brandon Woodruff. Um, you know, who else do I got in that area? Shane Boz, but that's a small sample and people might not know that name as much, but uh, Shane McClanahan. So like he's a high stuff pitcher that just needs to get it together. And one thing that I've noticed is that, yes, there are the kind of guys that the Tyler Andersons that have good seasons due to, due to command. Uh, but stuff is sort of stickier year to year. And so it's, it's, it's better, I think in the, in a, all things given equal to sort of bet on a, a stuff guy to rebound. All right. All right, Katie, you're up for pick number six. This is where the snaking starts, right? Yes. Like for me, you these are back to back picks for you me. Yeah, back to yep. back. Okay. Okay. We've done a lot of talking about pitching, but I have so many position players I just want to get into so, so badly. So I think I'm going to take Jesse Winker, my Ooh, first position guy. There you go. And look, I know his 2022 with Seattle was kind of a bust, but he's back with the Brewers now. This the Milwaukee, Milwaukee is a team that really needs to have some offense here. Look, the NL Central, like the AL Central, is a weaker division. I think the Cardinals are probably the front runners to win the division, the early front runners, I should say. But Milwaukee is still a solid club with some good pieces. They're going to need a, a bounce back Jesse Winker season. When you look at his stats, it's, he's only two years removed from his 2021 All Star season with Cincinnati. Most of his time, most of his seasons with Cincinnati, he was a pretty solid hitter in the middle of the order. It's always difficult for for guys to adjust to new organizations. And I think going to two organizations in two years might be a little hard. But I do think Jesse Winker is going to be in a spot where he can thrive. The expectations are still big in Milwaukee, but maybe not as, as heavy as it was in Seattle. And I don't know, something just tells me that when you look at the parks, they'll play in the NL Central the I know we're not playing divisions as much this year, but the amount of times he'll see some of these weaker National League teams in, when he plays with Milwaukee, it just it just seems like a solid pick. So I'm going Jesse Winker here. Yeah, I think the important update here for Winker actually came out about three or so weeks ago. He was already in Arizona working out at the Brewers facility. Uh, neck and knee injuries both last year. I think they were a huge part of mm-hmm. why he underperformed. You, you take a player out of Great American Ballpark almost anywhere you go, you're going to lose home run park factor, right? You're going to go into a more an environment that's more difficult to hit home runs in. The drop-off going from Cincinnati to Seattle was massive, and he's getting a lot of that park factor back by leaving Seattle and going to American Family Field in Milwaukee. So that alone sort of gives him a power boost, better health, especially given that he's not going to have any restrictions to start a spring training. That makes a lot of sense to me as well. So I think this is a good pick. I think the the only limiting factor with Winker as far as, as war goes for me is he's not a good defender, and might get a little bit of a penalty on that side, but I think he can out hit it. I think he can easily be a two and a half sort of win player. And that could be one of those trades that people didn't talk a ton about when it happened. That ends up being pretty impactful because of what it can do in the NL central race. Katie, let's go ahead with your third round pick. Well, all this talk about home run parks uh, makes me think of another one called Coors Field. Perhaps you've heard of it guys. So uh, my, my third pick here is going to be Chris Bryant Mm. and Look, the Rockies are not a playoff team by any means. Is he going to make or break that? No. 
Will a good Chris Bryant make the Rock make make watching the Rockies at least tolerable this season? Absolutely. Um, I think Chris Bryant just had a whirlwind, unfortunate 2022. I think he's too talented, too much of a high caliber player to let that happen again. You're always going to have the course field effect in Denver, so that's my my safe pick. I know he's not exactly going to catapult the Rockies up the standings by any means, especially in that NL West. That division is is very very good. But I do think he'll make the Rockies watchable. He is a pivotal part in their core for the future. And 2023, he needs to step up. So that's where I'm going. Nice. Um, you know, uh, the what were the injuries with Bryant last year? Back? Foot. And he also will enter spring training with no restrictions. Foot injury. Do they not even tell me, tell us what it is? A there foot there was back too. Yeah, it was back and foot. But they just like his foot. This is uh, oh plantar fasciitis. It says and a bone bruise mm, and lower back. Uh, you know these things are really difficult uh, to figure out. And I did pick uh, Jonathan India with the uh, with the with my first pick, um, and he's coming off the hamstring injury. Um, I was I was interested by this table by Jeff Zimmerman on uh, Fangraphs. It's called the it's from 2014, so it's a little bit old, but it's 24. Dis- 14 disabled list information and so much more. And uh, Jeff Zimmerman has a bunch of stuff in there about uh, recoveries from injuries. Uh, this table in, in particular is kind of interesting to me. Change in age adjusted OPS. So like already thinking about their age uh, and then their change in their age adjusted OPS on the DL for more than 30 days due to what injury? Number one is elbow. So the you the elbow injuries created the biggest drop in OPS. Number two was neck. Now that's uh, that's Jesse Winker right there. He had uh, disc surgery in his neck. Number three is wrist. Number four is arm. Number five is just head. Um, like I guess concussions, that's concussions. <laughs> I hope uh, uh, shoulder and then leg. Uh, foot is actually at the very bottom and it's, uh, it's positive. So like getting the foot figured out, uh, could be just a positive for him going forward. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about players that have had surgery and Winker had both of them, uh, had two surgeries. So just, just, just like sort of just rehab recovery stuff makes me nervous. But like I said, I picked a guy with a hamstring. Uh, so, uh, you know, what can I say? Um, I'm, you know, trying to find somebody that was just bad. <laughs> and healthy is is that better I, I almost like the excuse better you know what i mean like oh well you know his neck hurt you know <laughs> like okay well th- in fact i saw jesse winker halfway through the season i said you know all your all your stuff is there except you're just not hitting it as hard what's going on it looks like to me when i look at the numbers you're hurt he's like well i don't want to make excuses I don't, and i'm like you're hurt um <laughs> So uh, uh, I'm going to try and take someone who was just bad. He played 558 plate appearances last year for a playoff team and was worth minus 0.7 wins among the worst players in baseball on an everyday basis. He was below average with a bat. He was one of the three worst defenders on the field at his position. He struck out more than league average, walked less than league average, slugged less than league average, and was a negative on the base paths. Why am I taking this guy again? Yeah, you're not building a good case. Nick Castellanos, come on down. Oh, actually, I don't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I just like that uh, this is a guy with an elite hit tool. He's 30. It's not, you know, at 33, you start to sort of question the projections. Um, they're not as reliable anymore at 32 and 33. He's 30. It's not quite out of that range. He said that, you know, in the playoffs where he did a little bit better, uh, you know, in the postseason, not necessarily offensively, but a little bit better defensively. Um, You know, he said that sometimes he struggles with focus. So I'm hoping that, you know, they're going to rely on him to be uh, everything he could be while Bryce Harper is out. Um, And I'm just sort of a natural regression to his past talent. He's had some bad years in the past. Uh, He's been up and down. Um, in 2020, he was barely above replacement. In 2017, he was a below average player. So he's had some up and downs, but he usually comes back. So this is not so much a scientific argument as a they're going to play him every day. He's in a good situation and he's bounced back before. Yeah, year two of a five year deal. So 
playing time is not a concern <laughs> at all. I do think there's some similarities to Jesse Winker. Winker's injury history, even prior to this year, is much worse than than Castellanos's. And again, I believe in both of these players as as bounce back players. But with Castellanos, he's just he's a good accumulator as a hitter. You you're probably not getting anything worse at the plate than what you got last year, and odds are you're getting something quite a bit better. So this makes a lot of sense. I mean, the barrel rate dropping to a career worst 6.6% last year seems pretty odd. I imagine he gets a lot of that back and uh, kind of important for the Phillies during the extended absence for Bryce Harper to have guys like Nick Castellanos kind of step up and keep that team in contention in the NL East, just given how tough that division is going to be. My next pick will not surprise anyone. I'm going to take... Anthony Rendon, because as you have all learned about me over the last year or so, I fall into the Angels trap each and every time, every single time. (laughs) Part of falling into that trap is believing that Anthony Rendon will actually stay healthy enough to have at least one good season as a member of the Angels, right? The, The curse of Artie Moreno, it may still hang over this franchise all year, Maybe I'm not going to go all in and say they're a playoff team. Maybe I'm not going to do that this year. But I think Anthony Rendon is a very good player who has a core set of skills as a hitter that will age exceptionally well. So health permitting, I have no doubts about his ability to hit. I think he brings a K-rate under 20%. He draws walks. He's got 20 home run power with room for a little bit more. And being surrounded by a couple of other superstars, could make the counting stats really nice too. So if you're thinking about it from a fantasy perspective, yes, I do like the Anthony Rendon bounce back potential there. Real life perspective, this is the guy that was running wars right around six wins above replacement. Three straight seasons before the shortened season, which was his first in Anaheim. So I know it's been a really tough road for him in terms of all the missed time these past two seasons. But for me, Anthony Rendon has that high risk, high reward that I clearly am looking for in my build. I was just about to say, you are sticking to a theme here. Mm-hmm. You are the kind of person Angels ownership targets on why they will still have jobs. <laughs> Always giving them chances when they don't deserve it. But I do like the theme here because if if all of your picks so far pan out, I think Tatis is sweating a little bit. Yeah, I think I he's so. got, had a nice draft so far. And the nice part is that some of them have such high upside that even if you you crap out on a couple of them, you might still win based on the upside of the rest. I might hit on two, and that might be enough to defeat Tatis and defeat both of you. We should have had a, some kind of stakes on this. I don't know. Beer, probably, for the three no, of us. Now you say it. Now yeah, you like your draft. <laughs> I was nervous. I had, the third, I had the third pick. I didn't want to put anything out there. But I, I, I could be talked into a friendly wager. Uh, I'll kick off round four with a... Feeling himself. A, a player that hasn't... He doesn't have the ceiling that the other players I've, I've drafted has, but I, I think he's underrated in a lot of ways. Another Ray, I'm going to take Brandon Lau. I think Brandon Lau plays enough, probably working more on a big side platoon eventually for the Rays that he's not necessarily an everyday guy. In the past, he's had that opportunity. I think 2021, he got up to 615 plate appearances. But he's one of those guys that even though he strikes out a lot, he hits the ball very hard when he's healthy. He's a 30 home run guy for me. I, I think he's at least passable with the glove, even though he's probably a negative defender. So I'm not taking a big hit on that side. I think he's pretty important to them. The more I look at the Rays, the more I wonder if if Josh Lowe and Vidal Brujan and some of those young guys are actually going to take larger roles or if they're really just kind of fourth outfielders and, and bench players. So maybe maybe there's a, one more year for Lau to be a really important part of the Rays lineup before he ends up probably getting flipped to someone else or, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, how, how much do they like Brandon Lau? How much do they like the players they extend? That's something I always struggle with when I look at the Rays. You're right. He could be traded at any moment. <laughs> That's the life of the Ray. And then if he gets traded, I'm not as confident in him. But if they keep him, because I believe in what they see, I feel he can be a three-win player again. I think one of the only problems with him in the past has been large splits against lefties, bad oh, splits against brutal. lefties. But, you know, in 2021, he still had 615 plate appearances. And as this Rays team goes, like, you know, one of their players may have to be out there, even if there's a lefty on the mound, in terms of you can only really platoon at three spots. And, you know, they may have a platoon at third, first, 
and and maybe one outfield position or or DH. So if they if they are platooning at those three spots, they may just have to stick Lau out there every day, um, and that might be in his favor. Uh, another good one. I realized that I had my games played uh, in 2021 uh, threshold too high. Ah, yes. That definitely kept you away from a few of the players that I really like. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> it, w- it was a back injury for Lau last year and for a power hitter especially. That's a bit of a concern. Playing around that, he kept the barrel rate above 10%. He's done that every single year he's been in the big leagues. And when he's healthy, we've seen you know, 14 to 17 percent barrel rates from Laos. So, just a guy that can absolutely crush the ball when he's healthy. I'm just waiting for that update. I'm waiting for that update from the Rays beat to tell me that Brandon Lau feels fantastic and he's best been, shape best of race. his life. He's been pulling cars <laughs> down the street prior to spring training, you know, just doing the world's strongest man type stuff. Like, that's what I'm hoping to get for an update on Brandon Lau. But I like him as a, a good value in this range. It's a good pick. It's a good pick. So I've got uh, Nick Castellanos, Jonathan India, and Michael Kopech. We've got a, a, a sort of flex position there, and I need one more pitcher. There's a pitcher I actually like much better than the other pitchers, so I'm going to take this pitcher. Uh, also, uh, though his velocity was down a little bit, uh, oh, why am I looking at his curveball velocity? That's very strange. <laughs> well, anyway, his velocity was down a little bit uh, compared to previous seasons. It wasn't down at the end of the season like some of the other names I was looking at. And so uh, I'm going to hope that that's a good indicator of uh, his general health. And then the other thing I like about him is he's added a sweeper uh, that gives him a really big weapon against right-handers. He always had a devastating curveball. And his name is Lance McCullers Jr. So I'm betting on a rebound in health. You know, when he threw 162 innings in 2021, he was able to put up three wins. And so I want those three wins for my team. I always wonder with McCullers, you know, what's what's his actual ceiling given the combination of arm injuries, right? We talk about guys that go through Tommy John and if they don't have a lot of other arm stuff they've dealt with they can bounce all the way back to a full workload is McCullers one of those guys you know when you look at him you say in the 162 innings we saw in 2021 that's probably a reasonable ceiling in part because the Astros might try to manage him a little more carefully year over year even though he's you know in his late 20s now are they at the point as a perennial playoff team where they look at McCullers and just make sure they don't overwork him for the sake of having him as healthy as possible in October Sure. I mean, that is definitely an issue with this team and that they're, they have good depth. Uh, on the other hand, they just lost their top end uh, talent in Justin Verlander. And, uh, you know, Hunter Brown, their, their depth is less tested. Hunter Brown is the best of their depth. And although I'm excited about him, uh, the team would probably rather have McCullers in there. It's just more of a sure thing. So uh, if they can get out to a big lead, they may rest him. The thing is, with uh, just wanting 150 or 160 innings, I've baked in, you know, a lot of the team messing around with them, giving him, mm-hmm. you know, the whole all-star break off and giving him a start around there off and maybe an IL stint. Like, that, you can fit all that into 150 innings. You know? mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm hoping for just a sort of regular injury level rather than the kind of exaggerated injury level he had last year. Yeah, I think he's actually, I bring it up because I think he's become a little bit underrated for what he can do on a per-start basis since we don't usually see him on the leaderboards. We don't see him as a, a, a workhorse. doesn't hit that qualified pitcher. You know, there's a lot of, you have to have the right threshold, I'm learning in this draft. <laughs> <laughs> threshold management key to success yeah. in the 2023 <laughs> rebound draft. Uh, Katie, you are up with the final pick of round four. So I'm, I'm torn between two high leverage relievers that will be pitching for two postseason caliber teams. And I need a pitcher. I still don't know, but I think I'm going to go on a whim here. And I think I'm going to go with Josh Hader. Um, I know it's his uh, 2022 first half stellar 
second half, not so much. It was right after the trade deadline. Looked like a pretty uh, devastating trade for the Brewers in terms of clubhouse culture. And he did not look good for his majority of the time with the Padres. But when you look at San Diego, I think it is not crazy to, to suggest that they are the NL West favorites to start the season. And they have plenty of offense. Uh, but I, I think their, their relief pitching, especially that closing job, is going to be super imperative in their success. Josh Hader is going to have a, a a lot to do there. So, yeah, I'm I'm going with with Hader. I I don't I think his struggles were just simply because well not totally related to this, but I do think that the trade, which was so sudden, really impacted him. You obviously, as a guy who's been good pretty much his whole career, want to come out and perform for a team that's hungry to reach the postseason, and he struggled. But I don't see that happening again in 2023. I'm going to go with Josh Hader here. Yeah, after the the kind of the pre-trade wobbling started, had that brief time where the Padres weren't using him to close out games, he put it together down the stretch in the regular season and really looked like himself in the mm-hmm. postseason. You look back at what he did each of the three full seasons, kind of working around 2020, over two wins above replacement. I mean, a, a top shelf reliever. I don't I don't like to buy into players like this for too long, but I think we saw enough from Hayter to believe that he still really has it. I think you're, you're right. I think he's a great target here with starting pitching being so thin in this particular situation that we're, we're going through. He's also yeah. a reminder that like, you know, players are human, uh, you know, as he was in, in the deep, the, the depth of his struggles, his uh, wife was having complications in pregnancy. So um, probably a little bit of uh, his mind, not being totally at the ballpark every day. And, totally understandable uh, too. And yeah, how that can can affect the players, you know. Just a little reminder: they're human beings. I did, the one thing that caps him is he's a closer. So, uh, but you know, he's been such an excellent closer. If he gets back, you know, getting more than two wins uh, as a closer is something that isn't normal. Like, you know, for last year, the uh, top relievers there were four, five of them that uh, got more than two wins. Um, so, you know, that's, uh, that's really elite territory and that is where he belonged before. So he can totally get back to that. And that what? did deter me a little bit in terms of why I would pick a reliever over a starter, but there were just not a lot of starting pitchers that I was crazy about that the I think could have netted two, exactly. right? Like the, we're looking at the same thing in terms of projected war. They're all around two. So I think Josh Hader was probably the, the safest bet in terms of bouncing back or rebounding as we would say in this draft and uh, mm-hmm. he'll again what he has to do for the Padres to be successful is is pretty clear so I told you guys in the beginning of the draft I'll say it again how this player impacts their team's success was big on my strategy here what's success in this particular draft like when how are we going to look back at this end of the year and say that was a good pick is it two war is it like what's the what's our What's our marker individually? I, my, mine's two, but I'm curious if, if yours are are different because Hater can make can make that threshold as an elite reliever, and even some of the position players we might expect the possibility of more. We do have to understand that health and aging might keep them from getting back to these previous ceilings. So, at what level are you satisfied with the picks that we're making today? As long I mean, as they it, beat Tatis. Yeah. <laughs> but it's also, you know, I think that uh, it could be a little bit less of a strict threshold because, you know, I think Hader could get back to, you know, sort of one and a half win territory, you know, and yet be the dominant closer um, that sometimes Robert Suarez steps in for. Not necessarily because of uh, talent or, or performance, but because they're trying to keep him healthy for the postseason, whatever. It's not as much volume, but it's great. If if he is the everyday elite closer for a Padres team that goes to the playoffs, I mean, if he doesn't get to two wins, you can't call that a, a mistake pick. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, I like, I think we should have a little asterisk there that if they were an everyday contributor to a team that made the postseason, that they kind of did their job, you know, like if Castellanos is only, you know, a 1.9 or whatever, like, you know, he bounced back huge. He was an everyday player, average player for, for a team that's likely to go to the postseason. I, I would consider that a success as well. One round to go. Katie, you get the last pick of round I'm going five. Any Who direction. I, I'm guessing it's not a pitcher. It is not pick. a pitcher. <laughs> it is not a pitcher. I'm really making this very stressful because I take this draft so seriously. <laughs> um, I'll stick to one of the first guys I put on my uh, spreadsheet, and I will go for my final pick of the 2023 draft with San Francisco's very own Mitch Hanniger. 
Mm-hmm. I think the Giants are, I wouldn't say they're a, a playoff caliber team, but they have the potential to sneak in there. I do think San Francisco had, when you put all the drama aside from Judge and Correa, which is hard to do, they had a pretty solid offseason in terms of incremental upgrades. And I think Mitch Haniger is, is huge there. He'll be a, a big part in that middle of the lineup. And the Giants need Mitch Haniger to be the Mitch Haniger they projected to be if they want to be even keep up with the Padres and the Dodgers this year. So I like where he's at. I think, well, San Francisco is not an easy ballpark to hit in by any means, especially when it's cold out there. Uh, I do think that he's a good fit for that San Francisco team. And again, like I said, with most of these picks, he's going to be pretty pivotal in that team's success. So let's see. Let's see what Mitch has got. He's a right-hander. It's a little bit easier for right-handers there to hit it out of the park uh, because they're not hitting into triples alley or death alley uh the, the the alley that uh made everyone think differently about bust brandon belt than they should have uh, mm. top 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 end slugger in the game uh just happened to everything that he hit just went right towards triples alley um the uh the the thing that i also like about him and i i, I it's so hard with injuries like what's a freak injury and what's not uh, but, um, you know, this last year I did a piece on returning from COVID and, um, you know, Handiger said that he returned a little fast from COVID because he felt okay, you know, and, uh, he felt like, you know, in terms of lungs and breathing and stuff, he was fine. Um, but the thing about COVID is you shut your whole body down for a week and in that week we can lose fitness. That's not, you know, super obvious to you. He had an injury when he came back that he said uh, was 100% due to that loss of fitness. It was very strange. So if you watch hitters sometimes, uh, when they kind of follow through, they'll actually roll over their ankles. You know, it's part of uh, just normal hitters' uh, routines and mechanics that they'll roll over their ankles. He uh, did something where he rolled the other way. So instead of just sort of the normal rolling, he inverted it and got a high ankle sprain that cost him like two months. And he was like, I've never done that before. I've swung a million times in my life and I've never done what I did that day. And he was, totally thinks it has to do with uh, coming back from COVID. So that's just a really interesting thing. Is that freak or is it not? Is it just, would it have happened over time? Would he have finally done that weird swing or is it just related to uh, not being totally fit coming back up for COVID? So um, I think that's just an interesting anecdote that has something to do with why he missed so much time last year. But and how many times can you have a freak accident where it sort of builds up? Like he definitely had, he missed all of 2020 with injuries, you know? Mm-hmm. So he definitely has this extensive injury history, but um, you know, in each case he kind of had like a, like he's got a little story about it in terms of like, Oh, well they, you know, some people misread some of my symptoms and, you know, it took a while to get the right surgeries and stuff like that. So you know, it's uh, interesting to see. I, I think that he's uh, back home again. And if narrative helps at all, like he's definitely in among his peeps. He's a, a, a Santa Cruz guy. Um, and so, or Capitola to be more correct. And uh, and so he'll be home. Yeah, he was one of the higher projected players uh, on the board going through this exercise. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense. I think he's a high volume player health permitting for the Giants too, right? Some of the players we're talking about could end up sharing more time than they have in the past. I don't think Hanniger's one of them. I think he's got a, a clear path to the 600 plate appearance threshold that we want so long as he stays healthy. And I do think it's interesting when you look at park factors, it's tough to hit home runs in San Francisco. Everybody knows that. It's an upgrade outside of home runs for a right-handed hitter leaving Seattle going into San Francisco. Just your overall run production, every other offensive category we care about, it's, it's easier to hit in San Francisco for a righty than it is to hit in Seattle. Just the home runs that you might lose. So you might pick up average in OBP, lose a few homers. That's fine. Mitch Haniger has plenty of power. We're talking about a guy that's run a double-digit barrel rate three consecutive seasons around these injuries. So I think he hits the ball very well. Yep. And the reason we bring up barrel rate is it is the most predictive single stat for future power than, uh, than any other one. So if you're trying to predict future power, don't look at slugging, don't look at home run numbers, don't look at those things, look at barrel rate. That is the best single predictor. Um, My pick for the next one, I have uh, complicated feelings about, um, you know, there were times when as a prospect, I didn't love uh, his collection of skills. He struck out too much for me. I'm a guy who likes contact, Um, but he had prodigious, uh, prodigious tools and, 
uh, it was a big part of a, of a trade for somebody that you picked uh, in this draft, uh, Derek. Mine is third baseman for the White Sox, Juan Moncada. Hmm. And uh, since th- those days, uh, you know, some of the tools have, have fallen off a little bit. He was 51st in sprint speed last year. He used to be faster. Um, and uh, his, his arm strength is about average as well these days. But that's good enough for a third baseman. We're not asking him to play short or center. And, uh, you know, one thing that was still there uh, that he's done is the raw power was still there. So in terms of his maximum exit velocity, he was still, uh, you know, a, an above average uh, player at 80th percentile, basically. So there's a guy who has got raw power. He's demonstrated better power outcomes in the past. And mostly he's walked more. The other nice thing is, even throughout all his struggles, he's been a premium defender at third base. So that's going to inflate my war totals. So even if next year Juan Pincata only hits 15 homers and hits 250 with a 330 OBP, that may not, you know, wow your socks off. Um, <laughs> my socks are on, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with the high end defense, he should be able to get to three wins. And so that's what he's projected for. And as you know, as an example, uh, in 2021, he hit 14 homers and had a 375 OBP and had four wins. And that was just one season ago. And it didn't include, you know, Juan Moncada coming back and hitting 35 homers or whatever. I, I have modest goals. I do not need to drain the oceans. <laughs> <laughs> I just need Juan Mikata to hit 15 homers and get on base a little bit. I like this pick. Uh, I had him probably as my preferred option for this last one that I'm going to make here. In just Yay, a I finally sniped him. You, you got me. <laughs> you, you finally you finally hurt me. But yeah, I mean, because Mankata fits the bill of what I'm looking for, someone that does have that high ceiling. We've seen a four-win season. We've seen a five-and-a-half-win season. Half of that would be fine. He plays enough to get there. He's patient. He hits the ball reasonably hard. It's not like a double-digit barrel rate year over year over year, but we've seen flashes of a really excellent player. And he's still, he's not as old as you'd think. He turns 28 in May. For some reason, there's this idea that Mankata is past peak. He could still be kind of at the back end of his peak and all the injuries. And he's also someone that has talked about having, I think he had long COVID back in 2020. And that significantly impacted him as well. So, I like this pick, you know. I think the, the White Sox in general have a lot of potential bounce back players, plus the addition by subtraction, not having uh, Tony Larusa at the helm anymore, I think is a good thing for the vibes in the clubhouse Sleeping on a day to day basis. Yeah. I mean, like everyone's going to show up to work in a better mood this year than last year. How could they not? They're going to miss Jose Abreu, but they're also not going to miss Tony Larusa. So I think it's a net positive for the White Sox. Uh, after being sniped by Eno, I'm left with a really difficult choice. There's actually a pitcher that I want to draft here. And I'm a little bit nervous because we all had to draft two pitchers. Can I guess where he plays? Oh, I, I'm sure you know. Go ahead. Go take a guess. Texas? No. There's oh. actually two pitchers I like. All right. The one that I like for the purposes of this draft, though, I was, I was sure I was sure Katie would take this pitcher. But the oh, fact no. that she didn't. I, I think I know who it is. This gives me a ton of concern, though. There he is. <laughs> I almost did. I almost did. Oh, I was so close, but I didn't want to get the whole St. Louis Homer. Like for I, politics uh, next week, list. you probably should have. <laughs> I was on my list. I know. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Okay. okay. So this, this this was more of like avoiding the heat of getting the on the Cardinals beat writer, and I took the card. It's okay. This wasn't you've seen or heard things about Flaherty that give you some concerns that would make it impossible for him to have this sort of bounce back because he's another one of those guys, 27 years old, has missed a ton of time in recent years. He added up going back to 2020. I think he's just barely over 150 combined innings over those last three seasons, which is just brutal. What we saw in 2018 and 2019 was excellent. We saw K rates near 30%. We saw an improvement in his walk rate. The stuff was nowhere close to that level when we did see him last year. So that's that's the hard part of taking the chance on Jack Flaherty. But I feel like at the end of this, especially for a starting pitcher, when just being pretty good and getting out there for 25 starts might make you a two-win player pretty easily, 
this seems like a risk worth taking, even though I think a position player is a safer path to that war floor. I think I'm getting a little more ceiling going with Flaherty, but I'm surprised that he made it to the very end of this draft. Yeah, you know, I I think he's the perfect bounce back candidate. Again, I was playing, you know, oh, I don't want the listeners to think I have some sort of St. Louis bias because I see him every five days. But I mean, I think this is probably the sleeper pick of the draft. So a little bit of context here. We're, we're all familiar with, with Jack Flaherty's injury history. Really started with what you were talking about, you know, a freak injury swinging the bat back and when the pitchers could actually do that. And it just kind of derailed. It went from an oblique to a shoulder to a shoulder again. But this year, the Cardinals did their, their winter warm-up there. It's basically a fan fest over the three days in January. And Nolan Arenado sat down to do his media session. And him and Jack flew from L.A. to St. Louis together. And the first thing he said was, Jack looks really good. I mean, he wasn't talking about just form or, or pitches by any means. He was just talking about overall physique. And for someone of Nolan Arnato's status to say that about Jack, I was like, well, that is a step in the right direction. Look, Jack Flaherty is going to be pivotal in this Cardinals team's success. I think the Cardinals have one of the best infield cores in baseball, if not the best. They have a pretty solid lineup. The only questions for me is their rotation. But if Jack Flaherty can bounce back and not even put up 2019 numbers, of course, everyone would love that in St. Louis if he did, but put up somewhere close to being a number two guy because he does have ace caliber stuff. I mean, I think it totally changes the equation here in St. Louis. But I did not not pick him because I did not think he was a good bounce back candidate. Jack, if you're listening, please don't yell at me. And uh, I, I think it's a great pick here. I think DVR is projected high ceiling war could could blow Tatis out of the water. Oh, yeah, I'm looking and at the, 25 war here with this whole squad. The nice thing uh, also is that, you know, the Cardinals may have some trouble with uh, strikeouts in, in a time mm-hmm. when the, the shift rules are changing. And he's definitely got the most strikeout upside. You're talking about those days when he struck out 30% of the time. And, you know, the, 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 the projections aren't even capturing this because they're looking at, you know, past injuries and saying, well, you know, he's not likely to, to get back to the 30% strikeout rate, um, looking at past performance. But the whole injury thing throws a, a, a wrench into it. You know, even my model, like, you know, saying that he doesn't he didn't have as great stuff as he used to, all that goes out if he's just healthy again. Um, and so, you know, just to have somebody like this on the team that could strike out near 30% of the batters, he's, he's probably the only one who could. Yeah, he's uh, the only one that's really close. I mean, Miles Michaels can pitch for the strikeout, but doesn't do that too often. And the Cardinals, as we know, really rely on their defense, and that's why they have so many ground ball pitchers. Uh, but I don't really know if that's still a feasible method for success given the shift restrictions. Jack Flaherty is the only guy in that projected rotation that can consistently induce the swing and miss. So that's another key part there. Yeah. So pretty interesting squads that we built. Katie from that first pick taking Trevor Rogers in the first round, then going with a combo of Jesse Winker and Chris Bryant in rounds two and three before getting Josh Hader and Mitch Hanniger in rounds four and five. Did it turn out as well as you hoped, Katie? Yeah, you know, I, I, I like this team. I do. I think there's, there's plenty of upside here. There's reasons to be encouraged, and I'm excited to see where my squad goes. I'm doing my best manager impression here. Um, <laughs> You know, we got a couple guys that, that are looking for to play pivotal parts here, bounce back seasons, and uh, I'm really encouraged by, by what we got. It's the best time of year to be optimistic, right? That's that's what February is all about in baseball. Eno ended up with Jonathan India with his first round pick from the two spot, followed by Michael Kopech as his first pitcher, Nick Castellanos as his third round pick, and then it was Lance McCullers and Yohan Mankata rounding it out. So nice, solid group of five. Yeah, I'm mad at myself for missing the glass now one. That's just a, it was just a total whiff, a threshold mistake. Um, threshold. But, yes. uh, but I'm glad that the pitchers I did get, I was excited about. Uh, I only had really one more pitcher that I really wanted to pick. Um, you know, so I was worried that I might, my list might get eradicated by you guys, but uh, Nathan Ivaldi was gets a shout out for me here mm-hmm. in terms of uh, having the ability and the pitch mix uh, and the command and the team situation, I think, to uh, to rebound in a major way. The reason I didn't pick him was, um, 
you know, he had that velocity fall off uh, in the in the end of the season. That was pretty drastic. Went from 97 at the beginning of the season to 94 at the end of the season. That's uh, other than Adam Wainwright uh, was the largest uh, drop in fastball velocity over the course of the season. So uh, that's why I didn't pick him. But I think otherwise, I like my crew. They are all, uh, you know, the, the bats, uh, at least two of them play uh, premium defensive positions. That should help their defensive uh, numbers, help their war overall. Uh, and Castellanos just has a long track record of, of wildly oscillating from year to year. So I'm just riding that train. I'm overjoyed with the squad. I was able to build a three spot, <laughs> getting Glass now and Sale. My handwriting is so bad. I wrote Glass now while recording. It looks like I wrote Coleslaw. I did not draft Coleslaw in the first round. I drafted Glass nice. now. It was Glass now, Sale, Anthony Rendon, Brandon Lau, and Jack Flaherty. High risk, high reward. That's the way I like to play, though. It's more have fun. Take the players that could bounce back and be four or five win players, even if they have the downside of not playing enough to even accrue one win above replacement. That was my philosophy going in. I feel like I was able to execute that to my liking. So we're going to put this up as a poll on Twitter. You can let us know who you thought had the Ooh. best draft of oh, the three of us. Let's do it. It's going to be fun. It's we'll get that out there. Out. Someone tag Tatis. Let him know what he's up against. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. Just yeah. kidding. Please don't do that. He's got yeah. enough to think about in his <laughs> life right now. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll let him, we'll let him uh, have have some peace before all the all the questions surface again here in the next couple of weeks. You can find us on Twitter. Katie is at Katie J. Wu. Eno is at Eno Saris. You can find me at Derek and Riper. If you don't have a subscription to The Athletic, it's just $2 a month to get yourself in the door for the first year. Theathletic.com slash baseball show will bring you to that offer. That's going to do it for this episode of The Athletic Baseball Show. We are back with you next week. You've always got the green light here.